tales for dark nights. Ladder to Oblivion by Max Shepard. Performed by Kristen Holland. A cursory internet search will reveal that there were 91 unlicensed NES games. But I know that's not true. There's one more, and I've seen it. It's real, and its name is Ladder to Oblivion. I'll tell you as much as I can, and I hope that by the end you'll understand why I will never play it. As you probably know, Nintendo created a worldwide phenomenon in North America in 1986, when it released its Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES. By that time, more than 2.5 million units of the console had already been sold in Japan. The success of the system in America single-handedly revitalized the struggling video game industry. By 1990, 30% of American households owned the NES, beating the percentage that owned personal computers by 7%. I grew up in one of those households. I remember my dad bringing the NES home for the first time, beaming with pride. I was in complete awe. I remember sitting in our sunken living room and playing Super Mario Brothers for hours upon hours. What I didn't know back then was that making games for the NES was big business. Part of the reason the system was so successful was because Nintendo actively courted third-party developers for its fledgling system. Because Nintendo possessed a near monopoly on the video game market, they were able to enforce their standards and policies with an iron fist. Eventually, this got the attention of the United States Department of Justice, which started looking into the company's business practices. Once the Federal Trade Commission got involved, Nintendo changed some of the strict terms of its agreements. By Nintendo's count, there were 671 licensed games for the NES, that list grows to 677 if you include the three 10-gen games that were only temporarily licensed, and several others, such as Miracle Piano, which were left off Nintendo's list for unknown reasons. To enforce its licensing standards, Nintendo created the 10NES authentication chip. When the system detected the chip in the cartridge, the game would be playable. Otherwise, no dice. As you can imagine, many companies either didn't want to pay the licensing fee or were rejected as officially licensed partners by Nintendo based on the quality of their games, hence the 91 unlicensed games. To skirt the protection of the 10 NES chips, some companies configured their hardware to create a several millisecond voltage spike that short-circuited the authentication chip for just a moment, thus allowing their game to be played. Interesting stuff, right? Well, I thought so, and so did my father. He worked for Nintendo in the development and licensing department during the late 80s and early 90s, and got to experience all of the drama as it happened. However, the story of Ladder to Oblivion, the game that never was, does not begin with my dad. It begins with Rob, the founder of a game development company, and his idea for a new kind of video game. Rob was in his senior year at West Lafayette High School in Indiana when Super Mario Brothers was released for the NES. Like thousands of other kids around the country, he quickly became obsessed. After graduation, Rob decided to attend Purdue University to study computer science. He wanted to make video games. Purdue's computer sciences department moved into a newly renovated building in the fall of 1985, and Rob took full advantage of it when he started college the next year. Four years later, he graduated with honors at the top of his class. My dad always said Rob was one of the smartest people he'd ever met. Regrettably, he said, Rob also had some serious personal demons. Rob's father was murdered during a home invasion when he was young. His mother was spared and raised him on her own. Unfortunately, the trauma she had experienced sent her careening through years of alcoholism and depression. Unsurprisingly, Rob was neglected. And it was only a matter of time before Child Protective Services stepped in and took custody of him. At first, he acted out, but eventually Rob rose above the unfortunate hand he'd been dealt. When Super Mario Brothers came out in his senior year, it seemed as if he'd found the escape he'd been seeking. My father told me the story about the day he first spoke to Rob a dozen times, 
It was May 25th, 1992, and he was sitting at his desk when the phone rang. The voice on the other side hesitated for a moment, and then said in a rush, How'd you like to be rich? My dad had heard a version of that question a hundred times, and typically hung up immediately upon hearing it. But that time was different. Something in the man's voice intrigued him. I'd love to, he joked. Do you have a secret to winning the lottery? The voice on the other end of the line was humorless. I've got something much better. And what's that? My dad shot back. A new type of game, one the world has never seen before. I'm listening, my dad replied. Rob introduced himself as the president of a fledgling game company called LTO. At the time, my father had no idea Rob was the company's sole proprietor. The young man went on to describe the game he was working on as a platformer, where the player moved across the screen from left to right, collecting items and power-ups and fighting enemies along the way. At the end of each level, there would be a boss, with an ultimate boss at the end of the game. My dad informed Rob that Nintendo had already produced a game like that, to which Rob confidently replied, The differences are in the details. According to Rob, his game would begin with a young man who finds a strange wooden ladder protruding out of the ground. Upon climbing down the ladder, the character would discover that he couldn't go back up again. The only way would be forward. Just like real life, Rob remarked. At the end of each level, the player would battle a demon that appeared in the form of someone from their past. In every case, the enemy took the form of someone, perhaps a teacher, a parent, or a friend, who had harmed the main character in the past. After defeating the demon, the player climbed down to the next level. Nine levels had been planned. In each subsequent stage, the screen would become darker and the enemies more powerful. By the ninth and final level, the player would barely be able to see their way through the darkness. At the very end, the ultimate boss appeared, and the player would discover the truth, that the entity they'd been after the entire time was none other than a mirror image of themselves. Defeating the final boss would reveal a new ladder that led back up to the surface. What happens when the player fails? My dad asked. You don't want to know, Rob cryptically responded. Okay, so what's this game called? Dad asked. Ladder to Oblivion. Rob replied, nearly whispering. Eventually, Rob convinced Dad to meet with him in order to show him the game. It wasn't quite finished, but the young developer promised that the first seven levels were playable. My father was mesmerized. He told me it made him feel like no game ever had before. He began to see the bosses at the end of each level as the people who had wronged him. A fourth grade teacher who once humiliated him in front of his class. An old high school friend that he claimed had stolen his girlfriend. It was as if the game changed depending on who was playing it. When my dad brought the game to Nintendo, they refused to approve Rob's company as an officially licensed developer. Nintendo had very strict rules about the type of content that their partners could include in their games. Among other things, nudity, gore, cursing, and religious symbols were prohibited. Ladder to Oblivion's theme and content violated none of these restrictions, but it was rejected all the same. It was simply too dark, the higher-ups argued. Rob was crushed. Dad said, understandably so. He'd worked on Ladder to Oblivion for the better part of three years, my dad told me the day of the final rejection was the last time he'd ever spoken to Rob. I begged my father many times to try and get in touch with Rob. Maybe he still had a copy of the game and we could play it together, for old time's sake. Maybe, he said to me once, averting his gaze. I'll see if I can dig up his number. At some point, I forgot all about Ladder to Oblivion and figured the story ended just the way my father said all those years ago. but I was wrong. This past week, my father committed suicide. My mother found him in the woods behind our house, the shotgun he'd used lying several inches from his outstretched hand. The news was totally unexpected, and 
was a shock to my entire family. My dad was a happy man. As far as I knew, he'd never suffered from depression. I was devastated. Seeking closure, I visited my dad's study. He and I had spent hours in there together, playing old NES games and reliving his days at Nintendo. On a whim, I grabbed Super Mario Brothers out of its case, intending to play a final round in his honor. When I went to put it in, I found another game inside. That was odd, I thought. Dad never left games inside the console. He used to tell me it made them wear out quicker. The art was just how I'd pictured it all those years. An 8-bit image of a ladder descending into a raging fire. It was ladder to oblivion. That's when I noticed the note taped to the back of the console. I pulled it free and saw the first line said simply, To my son. I considered reciting the letter in its entirety, but decided against it. The words don't reflect my dad's personality in the slightest. They're too... dark. So I'll paraphrase instead. The day Ladder to Oblivion was rejected, Rob and my father discussed things at length, and my father was invited to become a partner at LTO. Together, he and Rob would complete Ladder to Oblivion and release it as an unlicensed game. My dad knew all about Nintendo's authentication chip and how to work around it. He and Rob both understood that many companies had already produced successful unlicensed games. However, they knew there were risks. There was a distinct possibility that Nintendo could, at any time, devise new methods to prevent the playing of unauthorized games. In spite of their concerns, Rob and my father decided to take their chances. Dad accepted Rob's offer, on the condition that his involvement remain private. His day job was what paid the bills, after all. Seven months later, Ladder to Oblivion was completed. Rob called my dad and told him the news. Dad was excited beyond measure. The next day, he had the game loaded onto two pre-production cartridges. He even had a trusted friend in the art department whip up a label complete with Nintendo's seal of quality. That way, Dad reasoned, they'd think he was working on something for the company. Rob insisted on doing a complete playthrough on his own in order to catch any remaining bugs and promised to call my father once he'd finished. They agreed they would meet afterwards, at which point my dad would test the game as well and discuss the next steps. When five days passed with no word from Rob, Dad set out for his partner's house and showed up unannounced. They hadn't spoken since the phone call and Dad had begun to worry that Rob had released the game on his own and cut him out of the profits. What he discovered was much worse. Rob was dead. At that point in the letter, my father began ranting about God and the devil, and his writing became borderline illegible. Sentences were scribbled over so heavily that they became virtually indecipherable. I was able to make out that Rob had left a note, which consisted of only four words. Never climb the ladder. At the end of the page, my dad hastily scrawled what he suspected had led to Rob's fate. He finally faced himself. While dad was terribly upset at Rob's death, he was undeterred. Ladder to Oblivion had taken control of his life. Ever since he'd played it that first time, he'd been battling a secret depression, something that I don't think anyone knew. The only thing he believed would make him happy again would be to release the game to the public. The following day, my dad partnered with an entrepreneurial-minded friend from his college days by the name of Eddie. That night, they got together to play the game. Dad started, but ended up leaving after the seventh level to grab some pizza. When he returned, he found Eddie dead, with game over flashing on the screen. Both of his partner's wrists had been slashed, with strange symbols carved into the flesh. My father's note gets harder and harder to read from that point, but it seems as if he was trying to describe the symbols he'd seen. Either way, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. At that point, he says he was convinced the game 
was responsible for both Rob and Eddie's deaths, as well as his worsening depression. He tucked the game away, vowing to never play it again. But he couldn't quite bear to get rid of it. For 24 years, my dad kept his promise. He never played the game all the way through. Until recently, that is. What I'm about to recite next to my father's last words. Verbatim, you can draw your own conclusions. 24 years of guilt finally caught up with me today. I climbed the ladder. Something I said I'd never do. I faced myself. And I was judged unworthy. Just like Rob. Just like Eddie. There's something wrong with the ladder. Almost like consciousness. It's more than just the sum of its parts. It looks deep inside you. Too deep for light. To the places you didn't know existed. Son, I don't want to die. I want to live. But my shotgun is sitting on the floor beside me and I can hear it speaking to me. It sounds so sweet. Its voice is a siren's song. If I can ignore it, I'll tear up this letter and you'll never know the difference. I'm sorry I lied to you. I'm sorry for a lot of things. Please know that I love you. Please move on. I'm going outside. I can't take it. Please. Never climb the ladder. It knows. I, for one, believe my dad. No matter what you all might say. He never told me what happened to Rob's copy of the game. For all I know, it's still out there. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.